Hi, welcome to 45th Street. I hope you've come here looking to learn more about the Lord. It's my prayer that something that will be said on this channel will give you more of a desire to be a part of his church family. I invite you to come visit us at our physical location at 7600 Division Avenue, so over in the East Lake community, or you can continue to find out more about us at 45bc.org. Well, here comes the sermon. My prayer is that it's a blessing to you. God bless you, and take care. Too long, too long, too long, too long. We have uh, we have allowed our young folk to be confused about what being in a relationship with the Lord is all about. We've uh, put them in a position where they believe they have to live two different lives. They have to live their church life, and then they have to live the life outside the church. I'm not convinced, I mean, I'm convinced that that's not the way we have to do this. They need a real relationship with the Lord. A real relationship with the Lord. They need to have him in their lives all the time. And so I don't think our worship should reflect those double standards. That's not to say that some churches don't go too far, but there's no other name that's better than yours, Lord. He is a healer. He is a provider. And my Bible tells me that regardless of the circumstance, at some point in time in the future, at the mention of his name, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Now they might mix it up a little different. They might put a, a beat on it that you might not be familiar with. But in the end, he's still Jesus. In the end, he's still a provider. In the end, he's still a healer. Come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great job, young folk. Great job, young folk. Great job. Keep on pulling us. Keep on pulling us. We'll get there. I believe I have uh, I and, and 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 pastors who are my contemporaries have one of the toughest jobs in the world, and that's to make sure that the church remains relevant. I think it's a hard job. I do. I do because because we we've, we've so allowed contemporary society to outpace where the church was. And, and because we've allowed contemporary society to outpace us in so many different ways, in, in a lot of respects, we're paying, playing catch up. And it seems like we're pulling the tradition out of the church, which we are. But some of the tradition never should have been in the church. Some of the stuff never should have been in there. It never should have been against anybody's constitution that you can wave your hand. No. Nobody should have ever been offended by that. Never should have been offended because somebody got up and clapped their hand. That shouldn't have been offensive to anybody. And yet we reached a point in our church, high church that is, when folk didn't feel comfortable clapping their hands or waving their hands or if the spirit hit them as it's prone to do, you know, we go and calm them down instead of fanning it so it jump on other folk. <laughs> We'll get there. We'll get there. We will. We will. I thank God for how we have come. I do. I do. So don't look down at anybody. Either way, if you want to wave your hand, wave your hand. If they don't want to wave their hand, don't make them wave their hand. It doesn't have to be that way. Every man, as he sees fit in his own heart, I think that's important. Today I'm going to start a sermon series that's going to last a few, few weeks, two or three weeks. I thought we needed to go back 
um, after some, some praying and thinking about it, and, and really it hit me primarily, um, pigeonholed it when I was in Bible study the other day that I hadn't talked about um, some foundational stuff that we need to hear about on a regular basis, some foundational stuff. Yeah, and, and I get the notion that there are a lot of people in church who do not understand authority in church. Do not understand authority in church because authority in church is not like authority in the world. Now, sometimes we have to be reminded how authority in the church in the church is, but in order to do that, we need to go back and get some foundational, some foundational information. And so, <clears throat> today I want to start this series. It's called Kingdom Authority. All right, Kingdom Authority, and it's not going to be hard. This is an easy, easy, easy lesson for you. I got three scriptures that I want you to read with me, and uh, and follow me, follow me, so we can understand how we've come to have this relationship with the Lord and what He expects from us. What do you expect from us? The first scripture, of course, would come from Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. I want to read it for you and it's displayed for you. Displayed for you. Moses wrote this. Moses wrote this. Moses wrote the five, first five books of the Bible. We call it the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch. All right. It's the basis of the Jewish religion. Genesis 1, 26 says, Then God said, Let us, let us, Trinity, make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. All right? You got you to gotta stick a pen in that. If you're thumbing through this, you got to know Genesis 1 and 26. It starts us out. And then... I want you to look at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 6. Luke chapter 4, verse 6. There is a dialogue there that happens in the fourth chapter of Luke. We cut in at verse 6. The dialogue is between Jesus and Satan. Jesus and Satan. And in verse 6, Satan says to Jesus, and he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want. All right? He said, I will give you all their authority and splendor. Underline this part. For it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want. All right? And then the last scripture is 1 Peter 1 and 18. 1 Peter 1 and 18. And it reads, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed, underline that word, redeemed from the enemy way of life, handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. All right? Not bought back, with money, not silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, we were redeemed. We sing that all the time, don't we? I am redeemed, bought with a price. All right? So, many of the complications we are experiencing in the church right now revolve around a lack of understanding of the fundamental relationship between us, man, and the creator. We are involved in an institution, we are a part of a, an institution, and most of us don't understand why it was created. No, no, no. We don't talk about the most important aspect of God's grace, and that's our personal relationship with him. 
Don't you know it's an honor? The highest honor of your life is to be able to call him your Lord. It's to be able to call the God of all creation your God. That's the highest honor we have. And so, to really appreciate our relationship with him as the creator, we got to look at what happened at creation. After God created the world as we know it, he saved the very best part of his creation for last. And that was the creation of man. Of all the wonderful things that God has created, there is nothing in creation better than us. Oh yeah, nothing better than us. We are the pinnacle of God's creation. A being that he created different from all the other creatures because God used the same matter that was used to create everything else, but he did something very, very different with us that made the difference. Use the same base material that everything else was created out of, but within us, he placed something that no one else, no, no other creator, create, part of creation got, and that is he pray, placed his own breath in us. He breathed within us the breath of life. And because he put himself within us, it's clear that we were created for a higher purpose than any other part of creation. And so I want you to be aware that it doesn't matter your stock or your place in life as you see it, God created you for something special. It doesn't matter what your last name is. It doesn't matter what side of the community you come from. It doesn't matter what your educational level is. What matters is that you appreciate that God has given you something that makes you uniquely special. Too many times we get caught up in our lineage, in our pedigree. We get caught up in who we are related to, and we forget that God is related to all of us. He made each one of us. Now look at this. This is, this is what I love about the creation story that many of us overlook. When God made us, he gave us no problems, no worries, no concerns, no fears, no diseases, none of these things were a part of the creation. He put Adam in a perfect situation and gave him everything he could possibly need. We can only imagine, right? We can only dream about that kind of state of life. And when we sit here and we look at what goes on around us, when we think about the tragedies that happen in the world, any man or woman would have to say, why? Why are we in this situation? What puts us in this spot? If God created us perfectly with no problems or issues or worries, then why am I having all these problems in life? Something happened. Oh yeah, something happened. The first thing you need to know, if you're going to take notes on this, know this, that when God created us, he gave us authority and it was graciously given to us. It was graciously given to us. Oh yeah, look, 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 look. In verse 26 of Genesis one, without consulting with anybody else, didn't have to send out notice or a meeting or anything like that, no committee meeting, God decided that he was going to share control of his best create, share control with his best creation. Look, he was going to share with us. And so what he did was delegated some of his authority to mankind. Look at this now. God decided, I'm going to allow this creation, my creation, to be in authority over everything else that I've created. He chose to allow the man 
us to control every other aspect of creation. Now I want you to let that think in now. Every other thing that was created. He let us name everything. Told us we had the responsibility of taking care of everything. Being green is no new movement. It started in the garden. Oh yeah, don't, don't, don't let folks think that's some new concept that comes with a political party. It doesn't. God has always required us to take care of, be responsible for creation. In fact, that's one of the jobs we have as mankind, to take care of what God has given to us. Yeah, he delegated it to us, but he was still in charge. Yeah, he delegated it. Authority. What is authority? Authority is the legal right to act. You can write that down. The legal right to act to act. It's the power or right to perform certain acts based on some kind of law. That's what authority is. It can be given divinely, it can be given civilly, or you can have the moral authority to act. The moral authority to act. If a parent decides they don't want to feed their child, How many laws have they broken? Well, we know first, we know first, if you are any kind of parent, that they have broken a moral law. Because any good parent would take care of their child, would feed their child. But it wasn't always such that they were breaking a civil law. Oh, oh no, no, no. Up until the 20s, it was, it was civilly more disadvantageous to not take care of your horse than it was to not take care of your child. The code that, that, that brought into effect the laws that take care of children came into effect after the code that came into effect that says you have to take care of your animals. And so don't think that just because something is a moral problem, it's also a civil problem. Today, of course, it's a civil problem. If you don't take care of your child, then you will be charged with violating the child abuse laws. But I want you to think about that now. Sometimes man has to catch up in terms of laws where God has always been. And so, supreme authority rests with no one. I don't care if you sit on the Supreme Court in any state, the Supreme Court of this United States you still don't have supreme authority. Supreme authority rests with God and God alone. No law that man makes should ever abridge a law that God put in place. All right, let's look, let's look at it. Let's, let's understand how, how it works. In Genesis 1 and 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the only document you ever need to know that God has supreme authority. All right? You don't ever need anything sub that because when everything we know was created, the only one there was God. He didn't have to get permission from anybody else. And so since he didn't have to get permission from anyone else, he makes all the rules associated with everything that exists. He has supreme authority when it comes to this world. What are some examples of authority? The president has authority. He has some certain powers according to the Constitution. All right? The president is able to, because of the power invested in him by the Constitution of the United States, declare a day to be a national day of prayer. He can do that. He can write an order declaring it. He can't make everybody pray. But he can declare that in these United States, this is a day that we will give over to, to prayer. Yeah, the mayor has certain authority that's given to him by the controlling document for whatever city he's a part of. People don't know this. Some people don't know this. But you can go to court in any municipality. And you can be found guilty by a competent judge and at a certain point, because of the powers in the controlling document, the mayor can pardon you 
from that. He can declare that that offense didn't happen and that you are not guilty. The president also has the same authority for offenses that happen in the federal realm, but they only have so much authority as given to them by the controlling documents. Police have certain authority. In Alabama, if the police see you walking down the street by authority, they have the right, if you're doing nothing but walking, but walk up to you and ask you who you are and where you're going. That is not harassment, it's called police power. So people always get that confused. I wasn't doing nothing and they came messing with me. They have the right to come and ask you that. Now, the police would be very, very busy if they stopped every person they saw walking down the street. But I want you to know they have the authority to do it according to the law, at least in the state of Alabama. In New York, they have the right to stop you and frisk you. Not just stop and question you, they can pat you down. That's what the law requires. Authority can be conferred, but the authority has to be given by the one who is above you. And so in the church context, why did, the, why did God give authority? What's the purpose of authority? The purpose of authority is to, one, teach obedience, and you figure this out, to maintain order. God gave authority to Adam so that he could maintain order over all of creation. Police have authority so they can help maintain order. The president has authority so he can help maintain order. Parents have authority so they can help maintain order in their homes. Imagine if you had no authority over your children. How many beds would be made? What kind of chores would be done in your home? How many toothless children would we have walking around because their parents will have knocked their teeth out of their mouth because they have no authority over them? So thank God, the state, not only is there a moral authority given to parents to care for their children, the state also gives you an authority to take care of your children and to, I love this part, discipline them and to discipline them. It says in the Code of Alabama, you can use corporal punishment to discipline your children. Oh, no, don't go home and wet it out now. I mean, it's... <laughs> there are certain disciplines that we get that come from being under authority. And everybody that comes into a church context doesn't understand those disciplines. People who have grown up in a church understand that we give a wide latitude to pastors in churches. We respect them because of the authority that, that they have. And as long as they earn that authority and keep that authority, we will continue to, uh, to respect them. We all know somebody who was raised in a house without authority. You know you work with them. You can tell. You say all the time, he ain't got no home training. <laughs> That's what we say. You can tell they are devoid of that kind of structure in their lives that helps them play well with one another. You can start early on when they start getting the reports at home. Little Donnell does not play well with other kids in the sandbox. <laughs> That's the note you start getting, which means that there needs to be some training done to make sure little Donnell understands that he has to get along with the kids in the sandbox or else he can't go to the sandbox with them anymore. There are people around us who have grown up not understanding that they have to get along with everybody else. They don't understand that they're supposed to go to work on time. They have to obey the boss. They have to listen to other people. They'll say in a meeting to their boss, I'm grown too. I'm not joking. <laughs> I've had somebody say that to me as they were being disciplined. I'm glad they recognize that they're grown. <laughs> they don't understand, just like in the world, people don't understand that there are rules in a church. 
Oh, they have rules in a church. Everybody knows that. Yeah, yeah. Rules that we follow because we love coming. I mean, you said choir rehearsal at 7, 30, 7 o'clock on Wednesday. People follow those rules. If they like the order in the church, people come to the services we have. They follow those rules. Failure to obey authority results in a lack of discipline. And I'm here to tell you one of the problems we're having in our community right now is that we have a lack of discipline. We are rampant with people who will not obey any kind of authority. They won't obey civil authority. They won't obey moral authority. We got parents who will not take care of their children. We got parents who will not discipline their children. We got parents who will not do anything for their children. Not only do we have them violating moral laws, they're also violating civil laws. Yeah, they can be ordered to take care of their children and still won't do it. We have a rampant problem when it comes to discipline in our community. And so how do we get to this point? If God put us in the, uh, in the garden and didn't give us any problems, didn't give us any diseases, any complications, how are we now at the point where folk do whatever they want to do? How did we get from no problems to these problems? How did we get from no complications to all these complications? It happened right there in the garden. Let me see if I can walk you quickly to this point. You, you saw right there, right there in Genesis 1 that God gave to uh, Adam all authority. He gave him all dominion over every single thing. But look what happened. While it was graciously given to him, it was legally lost by him. Legally lost. What, what, what does that mean? That means that one day while they were in the garden, Adam and Eve, along comes an interloper in the garden. Someone who didn't belong in the garden showed up. And the, he was not a part of the conversation when God gave dominion to Adam. He wasn't there, he didn't hear what happened, and yet he came in and convinced the people who were present that something that was said wasn't said. And because they chose, follow me now, I don't want you to lose this at all, because they chose to listen to the interloper and not listen to God, they legally gave away their authority to him. So the authority which was graciously given by God was legally lost by Adam. How did we do that? How did he do that? When Eve ill hustled and the enemy came in and said to her that if you eat of this tree, you will not surely die. Now God said to him, if you eat of the tree in the center of the garden, you will die. But I like that the Bible says this in, in the way it was written. Moses wrote, now the serpent was more beguiling. He sets it up. He was more beguiling, which means he was smooth. Yeah, yeah, he came in and he snuck up to him. And he said, what's up, Eve? <laughs> you looking mighty jiggy today. <laughs> Love that fig leaf you got on right there. <laughs> no, she didn't. Nice, nice earrings you got on. This is what he's saying today, because he's still more beguiling. All right. When it was all over, she had taken of the fruit. And not only did she take it for herself, but she shared it with Adam. Adam. Y'all can call him Adam. We can call him so many other things that are not nice. Weak knees, handpick, whatever. He gave over his authority by deciding to listen to the enemy instead of listening to God. He legally lost it. Now, how do I know that he legally lost it? Because the devil bragged about it. The devil bragged about it, Ricky. Look, that second verse I gave you in Luke, verse, uh, 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 in verse 26, 
what God gave him dominion over, the devil bragged about being given to him. Yeah. See, he deceived the woman and the man, and he had... Now, let's let, get this straight, because a lot of folk mess this up. The devil had no power to take dominion. He had no authority. He was in subjection. The only way he could get dominion was if, in fact, it was given to him. And Adam legally lost it and gave it to him. Devil can't take from you what God has given to you. Don't, don't ever go around with that misconception that the devil has the power to take something from you. In fact, when he knows something about you, it's because you told him. It's because you gave him clues. It's because you spoke it out. That's why folks tell you, be careful, little children, what you say. Be careful what you say. Because you will speak your own destruction from your mouth. The devil is not omniscient. He is not all-knowing. God is. And because he's not all-knowing, he doesn't know what you're thinking. God knows what you're thinking. But the devil does not know what you're thinking. The only way he can get what you have is for a legal transfer of authority to take place. And so Adam did that. He legally gave away his reason for being created by sinning. And when he sinned, he gave the devil the right to his stuff. He stopped being a servant of God, and instead he became a slave of sin. The owner of a slave is not only entitled to the slave, but he's entitled to all the slave's stuff. The slave does not own anything. His master owns everything. And that's why the devil is referred to as the master of this world. Because he owns everything. What was Adam's most prized possession? His most prized possession that he had was dominion that had been given to him by authority. And when he sinned and came under subjection of the devil, his dominion transferred to the devil. Now, now look at this. Let me straighten this out. God didn't create the devil. Let me say that again. God didn't create the devil. All right? God created an angel whose name was Lucifer. And that angel thought that his lot would be better if instead of God getting all the glory, he got some of the glory. Now, they, now he wasn't just, he was an angel, but he was some kind of angel. The Bible talks about him in such terms that he was more beautiful, that his very essence and presence was a melody. And he got glory just from walking around because he was so dynamic. And he thought because God had created him so dynamic and beautiful that the glory that God got, he ought to get some of that glory too. In the end, that's all the devil wants is God's glory. You don't believe me? Look back at that verse I told you to read. Luke. Yeah. You look through that passage in chapter 4 of Luke, and you look at that discussion that the devil and Jesus are having. When you break it down, all the devil wants Jesus to do is give him glory. And he approaches Jesus at a time when Jesus is very weak. Jesus has spent 40 days fasting in the desert. He is physically weak, and yet the devil cannot break him. He challenges him on several fronts, and he cannot break him. And it's in this instance that we find the way to deal with the devil. And the way you deal with the devil is with the word of God. Oh, yeah, the way you deal with the devil is by knowing the truth. If you know the truth, it absolutely can set you free in this instance. And so the first Adam came along. And the devil tried to get him with food. He got him with food. 
The second Adam comes along, Jesus. And he catches Jesus at a tough time in his life. And he tries to use the same trick with the second, second Adam that he used with see, The devil don't have no new tricks. He just got new folk to use and all. The first Adam fell for the food trick. The second Adam said, man was not meant to live by bread alone. You got to know the word. Yeah. Jesus is already aware that what the, the devil wants is God's glory. <laughs> it's interesting that to, control, to uh, gain control over you, the devil will give you whatever it is you think you need the most. I want you to feel that now. Whatever it is you've been pining away for, whatever it is you think you must have in your life, Whatever you keep talking about to folk, that's what the devil is going to approach you for. If you present yourself as a man who is so desirous of a woman, you'll get a woman. You will get a woman. Now, whether she's the kind of woman you need in your life will depend on whether you let the devil send her to you or whether the Lord sends her to you, but you will absolutely find a woman. Just to know that even though this authority had been graciously given, and even though Adam, the first Adam, had legally lost it, I need you to know that it was righteously redeemed. Yeah. All right? This same authority, that's what's been bouncing around from Genesis all the way through Jesus' resurrection. That's what it was all about. If you had a ball called dominion, that's what they were passing back and forth. Adam got it. God said it's in your hand. Adam took it and gave it to the devil. And the devil was sitting there dribbling it. And he thought he was having a good time at it, except he didn't realize just who he was dealing with in terms of Jesus Christ. He thought that Jesus Christ, because he became a man, was going to succumb to some of the same things that the rest of the mankind had fallen to. Yeah, he thought because Jesus wrapped flesh on, oh, he knew Jesus was God's son. Don't get that wrong. He knew Jesus was God's son. But he thought when Jesus wrapped man flesh on, that he was going to do like all the other men did. And Jesus was the one who came to show him that you can be a man and still be righteous. You can be a man and still do right. And so because it was legally lost, Jesus knew there was only one way to get dominion back, and that was to satisfy, follow me now, the original debtor. He had to satisfy the one to whom the debt was owed, and the one to whom the debt was owed was God. God was the one who was due recompense. He was due to be made whole because of what he had done. When you violate one of the laws of the state of Alabama, you pay your penalty to the state of Alabama. When you violate one of the laws of the federal government, you pay the United States back. But when you violate one of God's laws, you have to pay it back according to the standard that God sets up for you. In this case, the only one qualified to deal with somebody who sins is God. God required that in order to resolve the problem, there had to be one who sinned, who came unsinless. Let me make that straight, that straight for you. There had to be a man like the man he created, who came through this walk of life without succumbing to the sin that was in the life. He had to be the one to pay the debt. The only one who's ever been born who was qualified to do that, qualified to satisfy the original debtor, is Jesus Christ. Because he's the only man that's ever been born of a woman who walked through this life without spot or blemish, without any sin whatsoever. And because he showed up on death's door without any sin on him, he was qualified to die for the rest of us and our sins. 
what had been legally lost had to be righteously redeemed. Because Jesus was holy, because he was righteous, he was the only one qualified to give back to a God who was holy and was right. Now, this was a high price God wanted. This was a very, very high price. But just like he gave authority to a sinless man, he required that a sinless man reclaim that authority. That's his high price. Jesus was the only one qualified, we say, to be an all-sufficient savior. He came and righteously redeemed the prize that had been lost by Adam. He put us back in a position because of his willing sacrifice back into a position to be in fellowship with God. He fulfilled the ultimate punishment. Don't, 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 don't miss this now. It's not like God, it's not like Jesus went in and said, here you go, Lord. I want, to I want to trade sin for righteousness. It's not like it was a verbal transaction. No, no, no. It's not like he slid in some of these perishing things of this world. God required the ultimate sacrifice. God required that this sinless man be willing to go to death sinless. That was what he required. And Jesus was willing to come and live a life that was sinless and die even though he committed no sin. That's how he redeemed us. And because Jesus lived sinless, because Jesus died sinless personally, he in effect took all of our sins to the grave with him. And how do we know that God was satisfied? How do we know that the bill came back paid in full? How do we know that God gave Jesus the benefit of his sacrifice? My Bible says that come Friday when Jesus paid the bill, okay. the question was still out whether or not this was going to be enough. Mankind didn't understand the holy transaction that was taking place. Mankind couldn't make the connection between the garden and the cross. Mankind didn't understand that what had been graciously given to Adam in the garden was being righteously redeemed by Jesus on the cross. Mankind was still unaware of what happened when they took him off the cross. They thought it was just a man who died to them for no reason. They didn't understand what he had done for us on the cross. We were still in the dark on Saturday. Some folk were just perplexed, but early Sunday morning. If you had jumped up and seen AL.com, the headline would have read, paid in full. Early Sunday morning, if you had checked your Blackberry, you'd have gotten a tweet that said, paid in full. Early Sunday morning, if you had checked MSNBC, the headline would have shown he is risen. Early Sunday morning, we'll see that what happened in the garden had been taken care of on the cross. What, what Adam the first had messed up, Jesus had dressed up. I want you to know that that's how we got authority. And that's why anyone who believes on him, anyone who believes that he died for us anyone who believes that he came to straighten out what had been messed up the bible says that you will get the same benefit that he got you will get eternal life i can't make it any plainer than that if you believe on him if you believe he came and lived and died for you and if you believe that god was satisfied enough to resurrect him you can be a part of his family. Amen. So right now, for those of you who have heard me, and you've never heard it this way before, you've never heard that Jesus died for you, I'm here to invite you right now to accept the gift that he gave you, 
I'm here to recommend to you that you accept this blank sheet, this zero balance that he gave you. Accept Jesus' gift to you today. Become a part of his family. If you've never been baptized, that'll simply be an example of you loving him and believing in him. I'm inviting you to come right now. If you don't have a church family, the elders of our church, the deacons in our church have come and they're welcoming you, saying, come and make this a part of your life. Make us a part of your, of your life. We're not perfect. We don't claim to be perfect. We're trying every day to be better. We've got a standard that says we're going to be the friendliest church from the parking lot to the pulpit. But you'll get that one at a time as you deal with each one of us. If you don't have a place to call your own, or maybe this was your place, and circumstances in life had you step away. And maybe today, today is the time you're trying to come back. Whatever your circumstance, as the choir comes up here to sing this song, the doors of our church are wide open. Whosoever will, I'm waiting on you to come right now. Come on. Well, there you have it. My prayer is that this sermon, this message has been a blessing to you. If you desire more information about 45th Street or any information you need about the Lord, I invite you to visit us at our website, 45bc.org, or come see us in our church, in our church home at 7600 Division Avenue. Again, my name is Andre Sparks, and I can't wait to see you. And so you can find out why we're striving to be the friendliest church from the parking lot to the pulpit. God bless you. Take care.